that's kind of like the warning, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good, morning. good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you here. Glad to have everyone here to be a part of this day. We want to welcome everyone who is also joining in with us uh, through the various forms of media. It is our hope, it is our prayer, and it is our joy that this day will be a joyful day for you. Happy Father's Day to all of the gentlemen here today. And, uh, and to those who can hear my voice, happy Father's Day to the, them as well. So glad to see you. I, it is my, as I said, it is my hope, it is my prayer that as each of us gather together, God will speak to us, God will minister to us, that we may be his true disciples, uh, committed to him and all of his purposes in this world. Thank you for coming and thank you for being here. Now this morning, in, in order to honor our fathers just a little bit, You'll find in your bulletin a insert there. The insert is a responsive reading that celebrates all of those gentlemen, those men who are in one way or another uh, fathers to some of us. You know, I, I have seen it and I have experienced it myself that sometimes you may not give birth to the child, but you are still to that child fatherly. And, and that that matters and as men as as men of God each of us are called to be leaders and ministers to our sons and daughters in this world so if you would please stand and join with me in our responsive reading this morning for fathers everywhere who have given us life and love that we may show them respect and love holy God hear the prayer for for fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends support and console them. Holy, Holy God, God, hear this prayer for our fathers that mourn. For men who may or may not have children of their own, but act like a father to someone in need of advice, support, nurturing, and love. God, hear this prayer for our father figures. For stepfathers who have assumed that role with love and joy, who have loved the children of another as their own and created a new family. Holy, Holy God, God, hear this prayer for stepfathers. For adoptive fathers who have heard the call of God to lovingly step forward for those that need their care. Holy, Holy God, God, hear this prayer for adoptive fathers. For new fathers full of hope, for longtime fathers full of wisdom, for the fathers yet to be and the fathers soon to be. Holy God, hear our prayer for the fathers of your church. For those that have shaped our lives without claim of family or kinship. For those who have taught us, guided us, shaped us, and molded us into servants of Christ our Lord. Holy God, hear our prayer for the fathers of our faith together. God our Father, in your wisdom and love you made all things. Bless these men, that they may be strengthened as Christian fathers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. Grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you'll remain standing, I should have said, we'll turn to page 374 for our first hymn, Standing on the Promise. Thank you, Brother Steve. Hymn number 374, we'll sing all verses, Standing on the Promises.
time and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Now you can be seated. <laughs> Our next hymn is called Are You Able? 530. Hymn number 530. this morning's regular offering and that'll be followed by our building fund offering.
may be seated. Our next hymn this morning before they turn it over to Brother Steve is When We All Get to Heaven. It's hymn number 701, 701. Brother Steve. If you have your Bibles with you and would like to join with me in reading this morning, we'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. When you look at this particular passage of Scripture in the Bible, some of you may have headings above the, this passage which calls it the, the cost of discipleship or the cost of following Christ. As I was reading this passage of scripture this past week, it occurred to me that the irony that befalls us to, to read this passage of scripture on, on Father's Day. Of course, as we go through the passage, I'll explain more to you that will help clear it up. But it's, it's an important passage, and, and it does remind us that, that in our service to God, it's our relationship with God is, is not always what God can do for us. Sometimes our relationship with God is not only what God can do for us, but what we can do for God as well. And that is something sometimes we kind of lose sight of or we don't think about as much. Uh, God takes care of us, but God has a call upon us too. And this, this passage is a reminder of that. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, 
he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the others is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. Will Williman once had an experience with the father of one of his students at Duke University. One day, his phone rang in his office. On the other end of the line was a very angry person. Indeed, it was a father of one of his students who blasted at him, saying, I hold you responsible for this, Dr. Williman. Me, he said, what did I do? Yes, you, the father said to him. You are responsible for this. The father was really upset that his daughter, who had just completed her BS degree in mechanical engineering at Duke University, had come home and informed her parents that she had decided that she would do missions work in Haiti instead. That's crazy, he said. A BS in mechanical engineering, and she's going to dig ditches in Haiti. Williman, who is noted for his dry sense of humor and a wee bit of sarcasm, responded to him by saying, Well, I don't think she dug any ditches in the engineering department here, but I'll bet you she'll be a quick learner when she gets there. That is not funny, said the father. It was completely irresponsible for you to have encouraged her. I hold you responsible for all of this. Now, what exactly did I do, replied Dr. Wilman. You know what you did. You filled her head with all that religious stuff. You know exactly what you did. Wilman responded. Now, now, listen just a minute. Weren't you the one who had her baptized? Why, yes, of course I was. And weren't you the one who read her Bible stories and took her to Sunday school and to church and all of that stuff? Yes, of course, the father said. Well, then it's your fault. It's your fault she believed it. It's your fault she's thrown away her BS in mechanical engineering to do something Jesus has called her to do. You introduced her to him, not me. The father, who had now completed all of his venting, said in a meek and lowly voice, but all I wanted her to do was be a good Presbyterian. Sorry, said Williman, you really messed up. You made a disciple for Christ out of her instead. With that, the conversation ended. A disciple is defined as one who is committed to the teachings and the doctrine of another. For those of us here, we follow Christ. It is his teachings and his doctrines that we follow and we believe in. Now the definition of a disciple has an, an important and interesting operative word in it. There is the word commitment. For you see, with, without commitment, there is only doctrine. There's only words. Without commitment, there's nothing at all. Now we are familiar with that word. We all know what it means. But I wonder how many of us have experienced or are familiar with experiences where the only thing that we really know and understand about that is, more often than not, they are broken. We see all around us, don't we? The devastation of broken and faltering commitments. 
Now, I'm not going to go into some long list of things. I'm weary of doing such. But I and you both know there are all kinds of examples of places where, where broken promises and, and commitments have occurred. We've all seen the kind of damage that can do to people in their lives. But I, I think it is rather safe to say that as a culture, a society, even as a world, the idea of being committed to something beyond our own self-serving interest is an ideal that is waning. Truth and promises kept just seem to be a lot less likely than fidelity and commitment. But as a follower of Jesus, that is something we can ill afford. The hope of our world, the reinstitution of all that is right and moral and meaningful, is in truth left to in our, in our hands today. God and, and his church need people. God needs people who can hold together, stick together, work together, flourish together. People who can surrender themselves and their lives and energy together. God needs people committed to the cause of Christ. Committed to living their lives in ways that exemplify the words and the teachings of Jesus. God needs his people committed to the life of the church. He needs disciples who will throw away a BS degree to do God's work in Haiti. And I guess sometimes that means being willing to go in the direction that God wants you to go as opposed to the way the world tells you you should go. There is a real temptation to avoid being committed to anything these days or in some cases being committed to the wrong thing. Being committed to the wrong thing can be just as destructive if not more as, as lacking any commitment at all. Yes, we are followers of Christ. We are followers of the risen Lord. We believe in what he said and what he did. We live by his example when we are living and, and thinking rightly. We are his followers. We find our hope in him and the strength uh, that we need for today and for all the todays that are before us. So we believe God is with us in all things. We believe God is our comfort. We believe that, that God is our strength. We believe that our faith in Christ is sustaining us in all things and through all things. We are committed to Christ just as Christ was committed to us. And we know we are called to let the world hear and see from us why that commitment is a good and wonderful thing. That is what the world needs to see. That in our commitment to God and Christ, our lives are made better and theirs can be made better as well. That is what the world needs to know, to see and to hear. Why it is a wonderful thing to know and believe in Jesus. But sometimes... Sometimes that takes courage. Courage to speak up and say, my God has done this for me. When this happened, my God was with me there. Courage to do what, what God has called all of us to do or called you to do. Courage to, to preach or teach. Courage to sing or pray. Courage to help and minister. Courage to give your time, your talents, and your service to God. Don't you know, there will always be reasons to avoid those things. There will always be temptations to let someone else do those things. It does take courage. Jesus saw the crowd that was around him that day. No doubt there were many there who were interested, very interested in, in following him, interested in aiding him in his ministry. But there is also little doubt that there were many there who were just there to get a good look at him, hoping maybe to, to catch a miracle or two, or, or maybe looking for a free meal, you know, some fish and bread, that kind of thing. 
There were many who came out of an overwhelming curiosity and wonderment about this man, not, not really interested in loving one another stuff, this turning the other cheek thing or giving the coat off your back business. They just wanted to see the show. Jesus recognized why they came. The words about hating your brother, your father, your wife and children, they're not intended to be taken in any literal form at all. They were being used to say to that crowd, there is more to me than just to show people. I need active participants, not passive spectators in this ministry. The road I walk will not be easy. You should be prepared to be committed. There may be things that you will have to give up should you choose to be my disciple. There may be things you will have to suffer through if you want to be my disciple. Your daddy, he might get really mad and call your preacher and bless him out because you decided to turn four years of college into ministry in Haiti. The road I walk is not always going to be easy. Sometimes it will be fun. Sometimes it will be wonderful. And sometimes it will be immensely rewarding. But sometimes it will be hard and demanding. And you'll wonder why you even make the effort. Sometimes the seeds that you plant, you won't live long enough to see them bear fruit. So you'll have to be committed if you wish to follow me. That is the truth of it, isn't it? But the church needs to hear the truth. It needs to hear Christ's words to us. The faith we have will always call upon us to be committed to our mission and to our purpose in this world. Jesus was simply saying, I need you to know that I need you. And sometimes you'll have to be committed, even when you don't want to, if you want to change the world that we live in. Those words still call out to us from the pages of our, of our Bibles. If we listen, we can hear them even now down deep in our hearts, even deeper down in our souls. Jesus needs his example lived out before the world. What he did and what he said over two centuries ago has been changing lives ever since. The truth be told, it's it's still changing my life. It's still shaping my life. And I bet you would say the same about your own. But he had to give everything for that to happen. He had to be committed to his ministry. He had to be committed to the sinners. He had to be committed to the cross. He had to be committed in the face of doubt and skepticism. He had to be committed all the way to his death for us and others. He, a commitment he kept. If anyone has a right to call upon us to give our all to him, he does. We were meant to tell his story. There's nothing more we need to say to this world than tell his story. We were meant to live our lives and give testimony to the glorious power of the God that we, we serve. We were meant to be a light shining in the darkness. We were meant to be a, a harbor for people coming out of the storm. We were meant to be participants in life-changing, life-giving ministry of Jesus Christ. But those things will always take courage and commitment. Those things mean we have to love Christ enough to, to stay engaged. There's a whole world out there that is lost. Here's another unfortunate truth. There are far fewer people in church today than there are sitting at home or still asleep in their beds. I don't know if any of them will ever want to know Jesus. I don't know if any of them will want to know what Christ did for them or, or what he would do for them even now. I don't know if, if they will ever embrace the church or the gospel we believe in. But this I do know. They are the children of God. Whoever, whatever, and 
wherever they are. They need him. They need to know him. The choice has eternal consequences. How many turn to Christ? How many will embrace him? No one will ever know that. But this we can know. Christ has called his church to have the courage it takes to reach out to them both in word and deed. You have to be committed to it. Whatever God says he needs you to do, just as Christ was committed to saving the world and all of us that are in it. So yes, sometimes you have to be prepared to dig ditches if that is what it takes to be the Christ the world needs to see. I close. Close of him is hymn number 593. 593. Let's all stand.